Today on Applied Science, I'm going to do a follow-up on my water jet cutter built from a low-cost pressure washer idea. So in a previous video, I showed how you could take a $130 electric pressure washer and connect it up to a water jet nozzle and actually get halfway decent results out of it. Uh, but as it turns out, that was pretty much a proof of concept only since the electric motor overheated and the pump developed leaks and it, it wasn't really going to continue cutting uh, at, this, at the level of performance that I showed in the video. So today I'm going to show what happens if you take a gasoline powered uh, pressure jet or pressure uh, washer and connect it up to a water jet nozzle and uh, see what we can get. So as you can see here, the results look pretty good. We've got uh, an aluminum sample here and uh, these edges are completely uh, unaltered. I haven't smoothed them at all. So this is directly off the machine. And then you can see a acrylic sample. And you can see the, the cut quality is pretty good. It's um, it's a really 90 degrees to the surface, everything is great. And then the material that everyone wants to cut with a water jet cutter glass, this one also came out quite nice. Um, you can see if you look carefully, there's a little bit of frosting on the flat surface of the glass, and that's from the uh, abrasive getting thrown around and actually fogging the glass a little bit. And then there's a little bit of an offset in the cut, which wasn't the machine's fault. I just bumped it and, and got the uh, XY offset a little bit. Also, I found out this machine can cut steel uh, a little bit by accident. You can see the bucket that I was using is a uh, galvanized steel tub to hold all the water that comes out of this. And uh, during cutting, it developed a leak. In fact, the machine was powerful enough to punch a hole in the bucket from a good foot away, um, very much to my surprise. And even more than that, uh, the machine continued boring a hole into the concrete floor of my garage where the bucket was sitting. So if I was good at doing comedy and videos, I would have showed you trying to bail out my garage with towels and buckets and eventually a wet dry vac that uh, eventually got the cut done and got the bucket out of there. I wanted to find a solution for this DIY water jet cutter project that would involve as few modifications as possible to the pressure washer. And in this case, no modifications. And so I'm using a $300 uh, delivered gasoline powered uh, pressure washer from Amazon and uh, there's no modifications to it whatsoever. It's completely stock. Um, I take the hose right from the pressure washer and connect it right up to this nozzle system, which I'll show in a minute. The operation of the system is pretty straightforward. Basically just start the motor up and the pressure will rise and then open the valve, which you don't even really need to let the high pressure water out the nozzle. Uh, add the abrasive flow to make sure that the make sure the water is flowing before the abrasive is added And then once everything is flowing you can start the CNC machine to move the nozzle over the workpiece um, Just a couple of you know slight problems you might run into one is that the pressure washer has a built-in Unloader valve which I talked about in the previous video too And the point of this is that when you're actually using it as a normal pressure washer when you let off the trigger and you want the water to stop flowing uh, the water has to go somewhere and so there's a valve in the pressure washer that bypasses it, bypasses the output and lets the water recirculate. And uh, in this case we're using an orifice that's a little bit smaller than the one that comes with the stock pressure washer wand. And so the valve, the unloader valve in the pressure washer can sometimes cycle between bypass and flow uh, because we're really pushing it right up to the top limit and so the machine is kind of unsure if it's supposed to be in bypass or not. So anyway, so the way to fix that is to just, uh, you know, add a little bit more spring pressure to the valve or set the pressure to be ever so slightly higher or use a bigger orifice on the uh, water jet nozzle side. I found that just using a pair of channel locks and just squeezing the unloader valve very slightly was enough to get the system flowing. And once it was flowing smoothly, it never went back into that oscillatory phase. Overall, the system is pretty well behaved, honestly, as, as long as the cut is going all the way through and the water jet is making it down into the bucket, there's not a whole lot of splashing. I mean, it, it gets a little bit messy. It's not too crazy, though. Um, the problems arise if you try to cut too quickly and the water jet doesn't make it all the way through the material. Then you get this, you know, big, pretty big spray cloud that comes out of there, and that's, that's unpleasant to deal with. So better slow than sorry is basically what it comes out to. Uh, there's sort of no penalty for going slow other than spending a little bit more uh, money on garnet, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but the penalty for going fast is a pretty big mess. Also, the penalty for having your bucket get torn up by the jet and having it flood your garage is also pretty uh, self-explanatory there. The precision is quite good. As you might imagine, the, um, the jet is constant, and so the real 
determination of how square and smooth and everything will be is how rigid your setup and how good the CNC machine is itself. And in this case, I'm already within about 1% of length across this, just from uh, a real estimation. I think I estimated the curve to be about one millimeter and just put that into Fusion 360 and used uh, its built-in cam feature to generate the G-code. And um, it's really good. The straight lines come out really straight. So even though the system isn't incredibly rigid, it's, it's good enough. And as, it, as we found out, it's actually quite workable. The milling machine that I'm using is an old bridge port that's been upgraded. So its control is completely modern, but it has the original motors and all the original iron is there. Now, obviously a lot of people don't have a bridge port milling machine in their garage, but that's, that's okay. There's plenty of CNC machines on eBay that are small and aren't particularly strong, like you would have a tough time milling steel on them, but it's actually a great fit for water jet cutting because the cutting forces are so low. You almost don't need any clamping at all. You do actually need to hold the work down. It's not quite like a laser cutter, but the cutting forces are pretty minimal. So if you get one of these small, you know, $500 CNC machines off eBay, uh, there's a really good chance that would be more than good enough to do uh, a water jet cut. Okay, let's take a look at the stats and the costs for this system. In this column is the electric water jet cutter from the last video. And then in this column is the gasoline powered system that you saw today. And this is considering uh, the system when it was sort of overclocked. And so this uh, electric pressure washer was designed to run at about 15 amps at 120 volts. But if you provide a flow restriction and then also play around with its um, offloader valve or unloader valve, you can get you can get the motor to draw more current because it keeps trying to run at the same speed. So I actually got it up to about 20 amps at 120 volts, so 2.4 kilowatt. I didn't measure the flow rate, but the uh, commercial spec flow rate is 1.7 gallons per minute, and the pressure is higher because of the additional power that we're putting into it. Uh, it the flow rate could be a little bit less than this, though, because this is the, um, the rated flow rate for its original pressure. But anyway, it's probably pretty close. I was using an orifice of 18 thou on that one uh, in order to get this flow rate at this pressure. Uh, the gasoline machine has quite a bit more power, four and a half kilowatts. I mean, it's just hard to beat chemical energy storage. And we're getting 3,100 PSI at 2.8 gallons per minute. So remember, the, the, the thing that's doing the cutting in these water jet cutters is the particles of sand garnet that are coming out at high speed. And so the amount of energy in each particle, one half mv squared, means that the faster they're going, the more uh, energy they have and sort of the more efficient at cutting they are. Uh, so the reason that these uh, water jet cutters use such a high pressure is because they want those particles of garnet going really fast because you get a v squared term. So you get much more energy for putting in more speed or more uh, pressure. But if you can't have more pressure because it's expensive and difficult to get high pressure water, what you can do is make up for it by just having a lot more mass. You don't get the squared term, so you don't get that sort of multiplier effect, but if it's so much cheaper to get a higher mass flow rate, you can win that way. So 3100 at 2.8 gallons per minute is still going to cut faster than 3200 at 1.7 for sure. In order to get the higher flow rate at the same pressure, we use a slightly larger orifice in the water jet cutting nozzle head. Now luckily these orifices are available in like 2 thou increments all the way from super small like 4 thou up to pretty big maybe 40 or something like that. And they're not very expensive so you can buy a few and try different sizes out if you're custom building a system. The focusing tube is the thing that looks like a nozzle that comes out the bottom of the water jet cutting system. And the trick here is that it works sort of like a rifle barrel where the high pressure, high speed water comes in this side along with the garnet. And then as it's moving down the tube, it's, the garnet is picking up speed because it's being pushed by the water. And when it comes out the end, it's going really fast and cuts your material. Um, the trick is that you want this to be sized in relation to the orifice. So imagine if you're uh, squirting water into it from the top, you don't want to be squirting in with a really large uh, jet of water because it's going to hit the sides and sort of overload the focusing tube. And conversely, you don't want too small of a, an orifice here because uh, it, it would the, sort of the stream would, wouldn't fill the tube up very well and you would get particles that don't accept the momentum very well. Um, I think the conventional wisdom in the uh, industry is to use like a two and a half or three to one ratio. So if your orifice is 10 thou, you'd want to use a 30 thou diameter 
focusing tube. In this case, it's not working so well for us because they don't make these focusing tubes in a large enough diameter. And also, um, the cutting kerf would be unacceptably large. So remember that you know, the diameter of the hole that's in the end of this thing determines how big the cutting kerf is. So if this is a, like you know, a two millimeter diameter, um, it, it starts to be not a very great cutting tool or you know, it's just not a really good water jet system. So anyway, so I bought the biggest one that uh, AccuStream had, which is 45 thou. So we're not even quite double this, uh, but you know, the thing works. I'm, I'm not having any problems with it. So uh, if you follow the same uh, setup that I have here, you should get pretty good results. Next is the abrasive flow rate. Remember, it's actually the garnet, the sand that does the cutting in a water jet system like this. And so this is a pretty critical element. If your abrasive flow rate is zero, then your cutting speed is zero. And if you add more and more abrasive, you get a faster and faster cut rate until the stream is completely saturated with garnet and there isn't really enough water to do that momentum transfer in the focusing tube. So there is sort of a, an optimal value there. And I haven't done a lot of experimenting to find out what it is, but I know that 0.4 pounds per minute works fairly well. And I was using the same value for my gasoline powered system today. But I have a feeling that you could turn this up quite a bit higher. I mean, in theory, it's not quite double the water flow rate, but maybe it's you know 50% higher. So you could probably get a, a, a much higher abrasive flow rate and hence a faster cutting speed. So in 16th inch aluminum, I was getting maybe two inches a minute with the electric system and I could easily get two inches per minute. Like it was much easier to um, start cuts and you know enter the material and things like that. Whereas with the, uh, the, the older system, two inches per minute may have been a little optimistic maybe, but I think it's pretty comfortable for this one. Unlike most other shop tools, the cost of the abrasive is actually something to really consider. It's about a dollar a pound delivered from an eBay source. And if you do all the math, you know, two inches a minute, 0.4 uh, pounds per minute, it comes out to about 20 cents per inch in 16th inch aluminum. And if you're cutting a really thick material, it's going to be much higher because your cutting speed is going to be slower. And so you're going to need more abrasive per, you know, linear inch of cut. Um, really something to consider. What you can do is get started with Fusion 360 and just check how long your tool paths are. You might be surprised. You know, if you're just cutting plain old circles out, you know, that's not so bad. But if you're cutting something intricate like a sprocket or something like that, all of those little holes and, you know, teeth add up and you, you, you might be surprised how expensive it is to cut things out. Uh, generally, this is why the industry only uses water jet for pretty demanding operations. Like if you're cutting carbon fiber or glass or ceramic or something really hard that you just can't cut any other way. Uh, that's when water jet really shines. So just sort of a quick cost recap. Uh, the gasoline powered pressure washer is 300 bucks delivered. The cutting head, uh, it is just a chunk of metal, but the tolerances are pretty tight. So you, you could definitely make this yourself, but it's, it would be quite a, you know, pretty decent machining job there. 300 bucks. Uh, the focusing tube, this one would be tough to make yourself because the tube itself is made out of uh, tungsten carbide. It's a really, really hard material. Um, I'd recommend just buying that. 85 bucks. And the orifice, 15. So what are we up to here? 400, 700 for this. And then if you want to get a CNC machine, uh, there, there's certain, I haven't tried them myself. There's plenty of like tabletop size CNC machines on eBay for the five, in the five to $600 range. So, you know, you're, you're definitely under 1500 to get a very serviceable, um, water jet cutter, which is pretty cool. And since the gasoline powered machine is operating completely within its normal guidelines, I would expect, you know, a fairly decent lifetime out of it. This one was really, the electric was really, really overclocked. Um, I, I don't think I'd recommend that one. Just a couple of last points. If you do this with the AccuStream cutting head here, uh, you'll notice that the, the top part doesn't really come with anything because this is expected to be connected to like a commercial water jet machine. So what I did was just got a standard stainless bolt from McMaster and drilled a hole through it that was big enough to accept this stainless tube and then cut a, um, a countersink into the end here that matches the uh, taper that's on the end of the orifice. So, 
this thing is, has a cone on the top here. I forget what the exact angle is, but I basically cut this on the lathe to match the angle here so that when you shove this in here, this makes a good watertight seal. And uh, it all comes together like this. And so the orifice goes in there with the cone facing up. And then this goes in here and you all tighten it down. And you'd be surprised how well all this works. Um, leaking is really not much of a problem and uh, it doesn't take a lot of torque to get these things to seat. Also, the, uh, the gauge and the valve are completely not necessary. They do make the whole system a little bit easier to uh, tune and control, uh, but they are expensive and you really don't need them. Uh, if I were gonna build this system and I was mostly just inter interested in getting a working cutter, I would just do this. Uh, get one of these high pressure, like pressure washer couplers, which is um, a, a, an easy item you can get on Amazon, and then just braze or weld in a uh, tube that fits into the back of that um, cutting head. And you can probably come up with even a better way of doing this than I did, but um, just put a bunch of like braze in there. Uh, you might be scared of 3000 PSI, but it's actually not that bad. And you've got a lot of surface area to braze this together. It, it won't come apart at 3000 for sure. I thought I'd give you a couple of quick project updates as well. Uh, for the Tesla CAN bus data logger in-car display uh, system, I'm kind of waiting on the Tesla car browser to be upgraded. It's really slow, and even though it works with WebSockets, I'm not able to do uh, super fast update real-time graphing, which is kind of the whole point of the system. And Tesla keeps saying that they're going to issue an update that will make the browser better, but it hasn't happened yet, and it hasn't been a super high priority. But when they come out with a browser update, uh, that'll be a good like motivation for me to... Um, to get the data logger project going. Uh, the Ruby laser is still waiting for the Ruby rod to have its ends polished. Uh, there's still some damage there from the last time I was using it, but um, this was definitely gonna happen uh, you know, sooner than later. Um, I think I am gonna redesign the way that that whole cooling jacket works since that was responsible for this thing uh, getting torn up the last time. Uh, but it, it is pretty cool and I didn't get a chance to do lunar moon balance, which is the whole point of building this thing among other, you know, popping holes in metal. But uh, anyway, this one will be coming along too. And then most excitingly, I've been working on this ultra high pressure chamber actually for a long time, but we're getting pretty close now. So we've got a hydraulic ram that's going to be forcing liquid into a chamber at, you know, hopefully 100,000 PSI or something like that. We're gonna see how high we can get and a lot of weird experiments you can do at ultra high fluid pressure. Okay, see you next time, bye.